everyone. Welcome to this Great Ideas for Teaching session at the Teaching for Learning conference. My name is Amelia, and I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an instructional designer at the University of Denver in Denver, Colorado. Quick, we've got no time to lose. Um, fasten your seatbelts, and I'll explain on the way. All right, ready to go? Awesome. Currently, we are speeding through time and space to get to some educators that need our help. The year is 2120, and it's been a hard one. This may be hard to imagine, but we've been experiencing unprecedented national stressors this year. There's an interplanetary pandemic, and that's been overloading our medical and social systems. Everything in life is also happening now via hologram. In addition, we're at a fever pitch with political and social unrest due to long-standing inequities and a history of persecution against members of our community. And this has gone long unaddressed and underrepaired. Also, because of this pandemic, we're seeing a lot of job loss, housing insecurity, a lot of food insecurity, and this has put a lot of major stressors on everyday people. Our social service nets are just too under-resourced right now to accommodate the surge. It looks like we're here, and I know what you're thinking. This is a really hard situation, but we're really glad that you're here to help, and we're going to see what we can do in the meantime to support these educators. We're hoping you can help us come up with some ideas to help them build their own resiliency and think about how to offer authentic and appropriate support to students without further overextending ourselves. And as educators, we don't want to step into those realms of a counselor or a therapist, but we do want to be responsive to student needs. So we're going to help them think of some concise, informed, and appropriate responses to some of the difficult things that might come up during a time like this, like student disclosures, or a need to pivot our classes and our homework on the fly. All right, here's someone now to get some help from us. Let's just jump right in, start by listening to this educator and making a recommendation about how they can best respond to this issue that's coming up in their classroom. Hey, Amelia. I have a tough teaching day today. I asked students to communicate with me if uh, they were going to be turning any work in late for any reason. And the student shared more than I was prepared for. They told me they're behind on their readings and turning in assignments because their uncle died of the pandemic virus last week and that their parent needs them to take on the childcare of their younger siblings while they make arrangements. How do I respond? How do you all think that? Um, this educator should respond. Go ahead and pause the video if you want to take a look at these response options and we'll circle back to talk about what we think the best option is. Yeah, I agree. The best choice here is B. That sounds really difficult and you've got a lot of important competing responsibilities right now. Do you have a sense of the timeline that might work for you to get caught up? And are there any modifications we can make now to help you moving forward? For an issue like student disclosures, which can happen across a really broad range of topics, including a history of abuse, experiences of housing or food insecurity, they might disclose their status to you, uh, a disability status or an immigration status. They might just share that they've had a loss of a loved one or they're experiencing significant health challenges with everything going on. It can feel like we might wanna fix something, which can be really overwhelming and is probably not what the student needs. Instead, try active listening. This is an opportunity for us to reflect back that we're hearing the student, and it also helps to validate and acknowledge whatever it is that they're sharing with us. Then, instead of trying to fix it yourself, get a sense for the types of support that they're asking you for. It may be just as simple as having the ability to tell you, and they already have a plan and some ideas for how to get caught up. Or they might need time to let you know what their plan is. Either way, encouraging them to think of some solutions takes the guesswork off of you. And what it also does is it extends empowerment to them to find a solution while knowing that they're going to be supported in doing that. All right, awesome job. Let's see if we can help anybody else out. Hi, um, I was hoping that you could help me with something. I'm not exactly sure how to navigate it. So one of my students stayed behind class the, uh, after class the other day, which is good because I've told them um, that I want to support them and this is a really difficult time and I'm trying to foster open and transparent communication about what they need um, but today they they said that they need help getting another person in my department to recognize the importance of uh, them having extra time on assignments and tests and so they want me to reach out on their behalf to one of my colleagues to 
help convince this colleague that the student should get extra time. So I'm not exactly sure how to navigate this. I was hoping to, to get your help. Good question. That makes a lot of sense. What do you all think that this instructor should do? Uh, and remember, you can go ahead and pause the video while you look at these responses to think of what might be the best approach. Great, I think the best answer here is C. I'm sorry to hear that you're having that trouble, and I'm glad you felt comfortable sharing with me. Thank you. I'm curious whether you're in touch with the Disability Services Program. I bring this up because there are folks in that office we can connect with that handle extra time for exams, and they can ensure that those needs are being met, not only in our department, but across campus. Does that seem like it might be a good option? So this response uses a tool called the three E's, and the three E's are empathy, empowerment, and education. This is a really great tool for thoughtfully receiving student concerns while also appropriately channeling them to the resources that are outside of ourselves. Letting them know that we hear them and thanking them for sharing shows empathy. Asking about whether they know about a particular service on campus that specializes in their needs can help to educate them around their options. And checking in to see if any of those options feel helpful gives them the opportunity to decide how they want to move forward in an empowering way. All right, time travelers, I think we have time to help one more person. Hi, Amelia. I was wondering if you could help me. I've got a problem with my class at the moment. I'm struggling personally. I know things are really hard for everybody, socially and politically. I really want my students to be able to communicate with each other in a positive way. And so with that in mind, I started some group discussion meetings online so we could talk about political issues and things that were on their minds. Unfortunately, every time we have a meeting, they, they just erupt into a horrible argument. I'm pretty certain my students are using discriminatory language against each other and saying potentially harmful things, but I'm just not down with the kids. And to be quite honest, I don't understand what they're saying. If you have any advice about how I could approach my students or intervene in a healthy and constructive way, it would be really appreciated. At the moment, I just feel like giving up. Yeah, let's check in with the educators I've got here and see what they think the best option might be. Uh, and remember, you can go ahead and pause the video while you look at these responses to think of what might be the best approach. Yeah, A. Today we are going to start class a little differently. I want to apologize for the ways I failed to uphold appropriate behavior in the past two sessions. I've taken some time to reflect on the types of conduct that both I and each of you need to bring to class. I also want to speak to the harm this has caused to some and offer my sincerest apologies. Moving forward, we will be utilizing a set of group agreements and I will be monitoring for those to be followed. We will also be doing those discussions in smaller groups and always with a moderator present. If you have any feedback, questions, or suggestions, please do send those along to me via email. The way that you take this on and you express this won't sound the same as the way that I'm doing it. Communicating honestly and transparently is an admirable goal. But it's important to check in with ourselves and see, are we trying to model accountability? Are we trying to create a new community space? Or do we need to vent ourselves? And that's okay, we all need to do that. So just doing some of the self-reflection, getting that out of the way in advance, relying on somebody in your support circles to help you through that can be a really great first step. Be cognizant of making inclusive and appropriate language choices, but also feel out your style. What makes most sense for you to go in, to feel organic, to feel authentic, and hit all of those points. A response like the one here is a good way to move forward. We have to keep in mind that we're in the role of an instructor, a facilitator, the authority in the room. You have the power to set the tone for what that classroom looks like every step of the way. And a response like this is great because what it does is it doesn't throw out the activities that you've been doing. It doesn't lay the blame or punishment on your students. It also doesn't say that all of the comments and perspectives that have been shared were equally valid. And that's really important as well when harm has been done. So what this response does is it helps us to model taking accountability, clearly outlining the reflection process we've gone through, being clear about what will be different moving forward, minimizing harm while maximizing learning in the classroom. Awesome job, y'all. That was super helpful for all the folks we talked with. Why don't you buckle up and I will drive you back to 2021 to drop you off. And on the way, I'll just cover some of those concepts that we talked about as a way of wrapping up. It can be really overwhelming and staggering as an educator to feel like we're responsible for all possible student scenarios. 
But the good news is that your students are incredibly resilient and you don't need to be able to hold, know, or fix everything for them. And in fact, we shouldn't try to. All you need to remember is one, be aware. Two, listen empathetically. Three, be invested in ensuring that they can access the support systems they need that are available. Four, focus on empowering folks to self-direct while also taking their experiences seriously. This is the single best way to get through a tough situation where you don't have all of the information and you don't feel like you have all of the tools. Uh, and five, utilize compassionate and appropriate boundaries as a key to cultivating that success. Wisdom from the trauma-informed care and trauma-informed pedagogy movements uh, has taught us a lot about the huge impacts that can be made with just a few simple tools. And you can use these as core guiding tenets to support students in an impactful way while not overtaxing yourself after or hopefully before you're running on empty. If you want to learn more about these concepts, look into some of the things we've talked about, please do check out the accompanying handout that goes with this presentation. Uh, you can go ahead and look back over the scenarios we talked about, find descriptions of some of these contexts, and engage in further resources. I'm also happy if you want to contact me directly. My email is on there as well. I love talking about these things and supporting educators as we move forward together. Thanks so much.